<clears throat> okay, we'll go ahead and get started. For those of you who are coming in, in um, on time, I was going to say late, but you're not late. It's right on time. Um, all the stuff that we're going to present today, so the slides and the demos, are available in Heather's GitHub repository. Um, the link to it is here, H, um, H. Gonzago, and then the Dev Summit um, 2018 in a great dash apps dash portal. So you can see the slides, you can look at the demos. Um, it's all available for you later. So hopefully you're in the right room for building web apps that integrate with your portal. Um, my name is Kelly Hutchins. I'm presenting with my colleague Heather Gonzago. LinkedIn just told me last week that it's my 18th, 18 year anniversary at Esri, which means I've been working with Heather for 18 years and presenting with 18 years. And I feel like maybe 50% of our demos don't work. So we'll see how it goes today. <laughs> Um, in this agenda, we're going to have this general um, overview of ArcGIS Online Portal, probably um, uh, review for a lot of you. How many of you are already using ArcGIS Online Portal web maps, web scenes? Almost everyone. So we'll just do this quick overview at the beginning. We'll look a little bit at inside the web maps and web scenes, so the JSON that they're built from. Um, we'll talk about adding this ArcGIS Online content to your JavaScript application. And finally, we'll look at working with secure resources, because there's often resources that we don't want to make public, but we still want to use them in our application. So some of the advantages of working with ArcGIS Online and Portal are that it's an easy way to share and manage these secure resources. Again, we'll talk about those later. Um, a lot of other things. I'm not going to read through all of them. You can read them on the slide. It's just a central place where you can easily store and manage your data. Um, you can have people building web maps for you that maybe aren't developers or web scenes, and then you can utilize that content in your web application. So I look at it as a big time saver. I'm um, a pretty lazy developer, actually. If, if I can not have to write the code that generates a unique value render, and I can create a web map that has a unique value render and just use that web map in my application and not have to write all those different unique values in my code, that's awesome. I'm all for that. So ArcGIS Online gives you that advantage. So this is just a quick architecture slide. So we have ArcGIS.com and Portal out here in the cloud. We host our web maps, web scenes, items, groups, other content. It's all hosted in ArcGIS Online. And then all of these different apps can consume it. Things like Web App Builder work with ArcGIS Online resources. Configurable apps work with ArcGIS Online resources. Some of the native apps work with ArcGIS Online resources. So all of these different apps can consume that ArcGIS Online web map or web scene and know how to display the content. So you can create one map and use it across all of these different apps or web, one scene and use it across all of these different apps. So you can do this in both 3x version of JavaScript API and 4x version of JavaScript API. How many of you out here are working with 4x? Okay, 3x? Great. Okay. So, I mean, you could do what we're going to show you in both cases. I think most of our code snippets, if not all of them, are using 4x. But again, this is also applicable using version 3x. <clears throat> so, in general, let's just go to ArcGIS Online and look at a web map. So, we here, here we have a web map. We can see that we have this nice render applied to it, some symbology set up. If I click on one of these features, we have a pop-up with a chart. So this is just a web map. Let's look at a quick web application. Oh, I have to sign in. <clears throat> so once I'm signed in, I just want to show you that this web map that's set up in here, if I use share and share it inside of an application, I'm just going to randomly just pick um, one of these applications, create it, hopefully quickly. <clears throat> Launch it. So this happens to be a configurable app built using the JavaScript API version 3.x. It takes this web map ID and it knows how to take that web map ID and apply the symbology to use that pop-up. The pop-up's exactly the same as the pop-up defined in ArcGIS Online. So you, we're just working with it from within a JavaScript application. So everything that you do in the web map, once you save it in the web map, it's stored in the web map. And the JavaScript API has methods that know how to read that web map content and display it in the app. Close 
is this. <clears throat> Same thing with web scene, which is a 3D view, right? So we can click on this link. It'll open up what we call the scene viewer. You can do the same kinds of things. You can define base maps. You can add layers. You can define some um, symbology or rendering. Same thing, if you save this out, JavaScript API has methods that know how to read in this web map and display it as the map. So everything that you do here, it's gonna look exactly the same in your web application, which is nice because again, you can have somebody who's not a developer, who's got good cartographic skills, who has good design skills, who can make the pop-up content look nice, um, remove all those object ID fields and format the numbers and the dates and make everything look good give you this ID and then you can consume that within your application. So it's a good time saver. Plus it, it you know, makes sure that somebody who's got the skills to build the app is building a nice looking, a nice looking app. The way that we identify these resources from within our applications is through this identifier, this um, web map or web scene ID. You can always find it by going to the URL of the item in ArcGIS Online. So here, we're actually looking at the web scene. If I look at the URL, there's a URL parameter, question mark web scene equals. This ID is the unique identifier for that item. And that's the ID that the JavaScript API needs to read the resources and display them. So you just need to make a note of that particular identifier. Behind the scenes, all the web map and web scenes are is JSON, so that's it. So if we click on one of these, we can see that this is, there's this unique identifier, so we have this URL to this item, this is the web map we were just looking at, and everything about that web map is stored in this JSON, so I know who the owner is, I have the created date, the modified date, the title of the app, the description, the thumbnail, so this is information about it, all in JSON. So that's the details about it. The more interesting thing I think for us as developers is the data. Again, we have that same unique identifier and we're looking at the data. So this is really what the JavaScript API uses to render. So that data includes all the operational layers. So it has the URL, the type of layer, the field info that are formatted in the pop-up. So this is how the pop-up is formatted with the chart information defined here in this media info section. So we have another layer, which is the centroids. We have information about the base map layers that are in the map, spatial reference, etc. So everything it needs to rebuild the map is stored in here, including rendering information, all stored in the web map. The JS API just reads that information and builds a map that looks exactly like that because all this information is here in the JSON. So really, if you wanted to, you could just write, create a web map by sitting down and writing out all the JSON. I don't know if you'd really want to do that, but you could. <clears throat> so basically, where do we see this JSON? If you're ever curious and you want to look at the JSON for a web map, <clears throat> let me go back to my web map. going to open up a web map that I have, open up my developer tools, look at the network tab, and when the app loads, there's a whole bunch of requests in here. You can filter by the network requests, and if I want to filter the requests, I know I can search for data. So here I can see there's this request to get the data. I can see the start of that. There's the operational layers. If I right click and say open a new tab, there is all that information I just showed you. So again, you would just open up your web map, look at the network requests, find the data requests, and then you can either look at them here in this preview. It's another nice way to look at it in the preview where you can sort of drill through that information in a, in a nicely formatted object property style. So that's one way you can see the information. The other way is using something called ArcGIS Online Assistant. Anybody here familiar with that? Yeah, okay, quite a few people. So let me just uh, copy this web map ID, open AGO Assistant. <clears throat> uh, 
how it looks like. We don't have our link right. Yeah. So it's ago-assistant.esri.com. We log into ArcGIS Online or into our portal. So I'll log into ArcGIS Online. I can search my content. I could just paste in my ID and uh, search. It returns that item. And then I could say I want to view an item's JSON. Well, I'm not sure what's going on here. It looks like it didn't return it. I'll just bring up another web map just to show you and figure out. I probably copied something wrong. <clears throat> but here is, again, that same view. So you can view the items JSON without opening the network tab and without, you know, looking at all those requests. You can just look at the, the information about the app here, the title, description, et cetera, and then the data, which contains the layers and the renders and the pop-ups and all of that information. So a lot of other things you can do with AGO Assistant. You can copy items between, you know, between ArcGIS Online and Portal and a bunch of other things. So it's worth taking a look at. So here's a code snippet that shows you how you use that ID in an application. So here we have some JavaScript. This is 4x JavaScript, but it's pretty similar logic in JavaScript API version 3x. Here in version 4x, we create this new thing called a web map. And then we pass in an ID. This is that unique identifier for the web map. And then we pass that web map to the view. So that's just like we're working with any other map. Then when we run this thing, then we have our application. So this is that code snippet, a live version of it. Again, all these demos are available in the GitHub repository. So you can go investigate the code and look at it. But we can see that it's got the same symbology that was defined in ArcGIS Online. If we click on the pop-up, we see that we have our chart, same pop-up fields. It's using the same extent as the web map was saved in ArcGIS Online, so all that information carries over. It's stored in the items JSON and read by the JavaScript API and rehydrated into this, um, into this map. Can I show you Yeah. I was just going to say, um, the really cool thing about working with the, the web maps or the web scenes and passing them in this way is, um, what you see here, those few lines of code, what you, if you wanted to recreate that web map or recreate that map from scratch directly working in the API would require, it'd be, it'd be a lot. There'd be quite a few lines in there. Um, so yeah, it, it definitely makes the workload a whole lot easier if you have access and you are able to do it this way. Yeah, it would probably be well over 100 lines of code, creating the map, defining the base map, specifying the extent, adding the layers, applying the render, associating the pop-up template, and, you know, specifying all that information would be quite a lot of work. Good yeah. point. Thanks, Heather. <clears throat> so web maps make it easier. And this, again, web maps, this is the logic behind how the web app builder works and how the configurable apps work. They all take advantage of this web map approach. So this is the way they all work behind the scenes. In 4x, we actually added some support for accessing individual layer items. We have this method called from portal item on the layer, where you can actually pass in the unique identifier for a layer item. So this is really nice in ArcGIS Online if you create a layer. You can save rendering information and pop-up information with that layer. Save it with the layer and then use that layer item to add that to a regular map or to a web map using layer from portal, um, from portal item. So that's a nice time saver. And again, we have a demo app that shows adding this layer from the portal item. Let me go to the source. Here is the source code for it. Let me make it a little bit bigger. So here, layer from portal item, we can see that we just pass in this ID. And I, to prove to you that that ID is actually a layer item, we'll go into ArcGIS Online. I'll replace this ID with that ID. Wait a minute, and we can see that it's this overlay schools layer that we just added to our map with just one line of code. And we got this. Um, you know, this nice render that somebody created in ArcGIS Online. 
and any nice pop-up information that's associated with it, we get that for free. Oh, I was ahead of the game. I think we have the same thing for a 3D app. Nope. I think the link is wrong. Is it? Because this is 2D. Yeah. Let's see, maybe they're backwards. Go to the demos. And up to go to the, it's the webs. Um, Web scene spelling. That might be the same one though. It might be the same one. It's the same one. You'll have to take my word for it. You can do the same thing in a web scene. Okay, now I'm gonna turn it over to Heather for a portal API and we'll get those um, link issues fixed in the GitHub repo. So if you download it, we'll fix them for you. Great. Okay. <clears throat> so sometimes though you might wanna have, um, when you're working within your application, you might need to have a little bit um, more, you want, you're gonna need to make some rest calls to the portal API. And within the JavaScript API, you do actually have that functionality and you can do that. Um, when we talk about the portal API, if you take a look at, and it's gonna be in the developer's help. So it's just developers.rts.com forward slash rest. It's gonna be under the rest API. Underneath the user groups and items, if you ever actually opened up RTS online or portal and took a look in maybe Chrome DevTools and just started inspecting the network traffic, you would notice that it's actually, it's making these portal API rest calls behind the scene, behind the, under the hood. And you can actually see, like when you're logging in, um, here, when you're accessing, maybe if you're updating an item, if you actually open that up, you would actually see, you can see all of these rest calls that are actually being made. You can do the same exact thing by passing in these, um, by using the REST API directly within um, a JavaScript application, just basically working with the Esri request method. I'm gonna go ahead and show you a little application, just basic proof of concept of how you can do that. Okay, hold on. All right, so this is a beautiful application that's really self-explanatory, um, but as you can see, I'm gonna go ahead and click on this button for get items. And what it does is it iterates through a specific folder that I'm querying on, in my, um, within my login. So it's, give, it's I'm querying, Heather underscore JS9, which is me, as the owner, and then I'm passing in an ID for this folder. <clears throat> so we take a look at the code. Okay, you'll see here, everything is done within this get content. So I have the URL, so I'm searching, and I'm passing in this query, Heather, JS under, underscore JS9, and this owner folder. And how I knew this ID I actually um, was sniffing it out using the, um, the dev tools. So what I did was I opened up the dev tools and I started going in and just clicking on my folders that I had and it actually returned back to me the ID of that specific folder. So that's how I knew how to do this. All right, so this is probably, it works, but it may not be um, you know, the options that you wanna take. So most of what you get, the common REST API stuff that you get We've wrapped all of that functionality up and we put that directly within our API. So this update, I'm sorry, not the update item, let's get out of there. I'm gonna go into our, um, our API reference and if you take a look at underneath the Esri portal, you'll see here we've got a bunch of classes that have been um, configured that wraps up a lot of this functionality. So we can work with portal groups, portal items, we can query, and our users, okay? So if I go ahead and let's say I wanna do the same exact thing that I just did in this application, but I wanna use the um, R API instead. Gotta move this down a little, getting thrown off. There we go. Click on that. It's gonna first off ask me to log in Give it my credentials. 
and I'm getting the same thing, okay? So if we actually look at this code, you'll see here I'm working with this portal, portal, portal query params, and portal folder, okay? And then the same thing, we have the get content. All I'm doing is I'm telling it, hey, when I call this off mode immediate, I'm telling it, hey, I want you to prompt me to log in so it knows who the user is that we're working with. It's loading the portal up, and by default, the portal is going to be RGIS, just RGIS.com, I believe. Once that portal is loaded, it's going to go ahead, it's going to fetch the folders of that user, which is me. Once those folders are loaded, it's going to go iterate through each of those folders, and then it's going to check to see I have one that I've created for all of my demos. Fetch those items, and then it's going to go ahead and spit that out into these little hyperlinks that I have on my page. All right, so again, um, basically you can work with both the REST API um, and working directly within um, um, our API with having those pre-configured classes as well. So again, with WebMap, WebScene, and then all of the ones, everything is gonna fall under the Esri portal folder. All right, I just showed you guys. All right, so, um, this is probably going to be a good chunk of what we're going to um, talk about in, for the next bit of time. Most of you guys are probably working on, I don't know, who here has secure data? Yeah? So secured resources, um, token based, who works, anybody here work with OAuth? Yeah? Good. Okay. So. I'm going to show you a little bit. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about working with the secured resources. Um, a little bit about working with OAuth. There's, we're not going to go in too much in the weeds. There's a lot of stuff on that, um, but I will show you how you can go ahead and work with it within your application, and how you can go in and register an application to get what you need to access um, this the security this OAuth mechanism. All right, so um, we provide basically everything that you need within the API to handle that security for you. Um, by default, what happens is, is when you go in and you access an application that is secured under the hood, well, I don't want to get ahead of myself. Yeah, I'm getting ahead of myself. Basically, under the hood, um, what's happening is, is that it's going to flag if it's secured. We're going to get, you're going to get some 403 errors. If you see that, we have the ability within our, um, our API that's going to prompt you for logging in. All right, so we detect all of that. We take care of all of that for you automatically. Um, again, like it says, if it's private, it will prompt you for your credentials. Um, that's with, if you're using the, uh, the named user approach. Um, you can also do it the other way as well, as if you don't want to pr uh, provide your credentials, you can also go ahead and have that, uh, your application handle that for you. And I'll talk a little bit about that at the end as well. All right. So what are some of the benefits of actually working with this? Um, we, so if you, when we talk about the platform security model, it's basically just, we're talking about OAuth. Um, OAuth is not an ArcGIS, it's not an Esri thing. It's a protocol that's been around for a while now. If you, it's not easy reading, but if you are interested in it, there's a lot of stuff online. You can go in and read the spec. Um, basically, we, we pull from that and that's what we use when we implemented that within our platform. When you're working with that security model, your application itself, so your, your HTML file, your actual application that you're working with, your hosting, um, you're accessing secured data, that application is not actually accessing and working directly with your credentials. So that's, that's a bonus. Um, you don't have to sign in. That's another thing, too. So beforehand, if you were working with secured resources, um, just like you know, server-based you know, token-based authentication, nothing with OAuth. Um, every single time you hit something that was secured, you were prompted to log in, which can be a bit of a pain. So when working with OAuth, you do not have to worry about that. Um, there is support for enterprise logins as well. So for those of you that don't want to have to, that you want to go in and maybe, um, I don't know, I don't want to get too far into all of that. There's, there's a lot of good information out on um, our documentation that we have out on our website as well that does talk a little bit more on that end. Or we can have Eric, who's sitting in the front row. He can talk about it too. So, yeah. 
Um, another cool thing about um, working with OAuth and the security model is that it actually can track how your apps are being used. So who, how many people are using it, when they're using it, what's the, you know, just the, the common usage statistics, you can get all of that through working with um, this, this security model. And then lastly, um, a lot of you guys may be needing to access um, uh, credit-based services, maybe doing some routing, things like that, maybe some um, um, demographic data that you need to go in and log in for. You can handle all of that. OAuth can handle a lot of that for you. So if you implement that within your application, um, you can have it set up so that your users have to log in to access it, or maybe you have an application that's wide open that you don't want your users to have to access. You can set it up that way too, and they can get access to these credit-based services. All right, so I've talked a lot. Let's just actually go ahead and I'll show you some of you guys this. So accessing private data in a web application. So let's take a quick look here. And what I have is I've got this web app that I have created and it's just a basic web app. But what happened is, is that when I saved it out, I saved it using a layer that was locked down within my, um, my organization, within my content. So it's asking me, shut that down here. There we go. It's asking me to go ahead and log in with my valid credentials. So I'm saying yes. And what we should see here, go ahead and it's gonna give me this, um, this secured layer that I have of the uh, train lines running through Chicago. So that's just one, one instance. Um, you might have it actually locked down to the actual web app itself. So if your web map is secured, you do not have that shared out, or maybe you only have it shared out with certain people, you can go ahead and same exact thing, it'll unlock it all and bring it all in for you. Um, one of the things I forgot to mention before was when I was saying um, we handle all of this for you under the hood, what you guys just noticed, what popped up, that's what we call, that's the identity manager. And what that identity manager is or what it does is it recognizes when you hit secured content and it will automatically know that it needs to prompt the user to handle those credentials. You put those credentials in. Under the hood, it takes that and it will generate that token for you and append that token behind the scenes to that um, to whatever resource it is that you're trying that you're trying to access. So let me try one quick one here off the top of my head. Let me do this again. Just what's that? That particular one, no. And I'm going to show you how you can do that. This one, I am not implementing OAuth. Okay, so I'm going to show you, um, so his question was, was can, can that keep you logged in? In this particular instance, no. Um, what I have is if we take a quick look at, I hope I can find it. I didn't test this beforehand. I just wanted to see if we can get it. Response, no, nope, not that. Try a couple more before. So basically, one of the calls that gets made, it will return back, and it's basically, it's going to tell you it can't, it, you're going to get a 403 error, um, that it can't access it. There's, there's forbidden data, um, and I'm not going to do this for the entire time. So, but basically, that's what's happening, is it's one of the calls that gets generated under the hood, um, and you guys, if you just ever want to play around with it, you can see it you'll get, one of them comes back, response comes back, says it can't access the data. Once it hits that, it gets that 403 error, that's when it knows that it needs to generate that identity manager, okay? So what I do wanna show you is, if you take a look at the code, there is, we actually have an identity manager class. There is no identity manager class referenced here. All right, this is still, it's the same thing that Kelly showed earlier. It's just I'm referencing an actual web map that's secured. Or actually, the web map itself isn't secured. The data within the web map is, secure, or is secured. So it automatically knew based upon hitting that, um, that uh, secure data that it needed to prompt for that identity manager. So, um, what 
else do we have here? Okay, so I showed you the private web map. So it's basically the same thing. You have the, either you can have your private web map, you had a public web map with private data, same exact thing. It's, it sees you have secure data, it's going to prompt you to log in. So <clears throat> you can also have a web map that has data that is um, secured, but maybe not secured directly using like RGS Online hosted services or portal. Maybe like in our case, we just have this server based, token based authentication. Um, we have this service that we've used probably for the past, I feel like it's been since I've started this company 18 years ago, but um, we always use it for like our testing. Um, and this is a good one for you guys to use as well. If you ever just want to test and see if something's working the way you expect it to, we do have some on um, some of our sample servers. Um, user one, user one, I believe. And basically we do have some, there's some secure data in here that um, you can just use for some of our testing, like in this case. So if I go ahead and what I did was in my web application, I actually created, um, I loaded some data in from that, um, from that secured service. So I just passed in a reference to the, that sample server six URL. When I saved it out, it asked me, it was like, hey, I recognize that there's some secure data in here. Do you want to save the credentials? I didn't want to for the purpose of this demo. You could if you wanted, um, and then you wouldn't have been prompted for this at all. But as you can see here, it's just, you guys have probably seen this or worked with this many times. This, this feature layer has been around for a long time. But again, it's the same concept. Um, you just go in there and log in with those credentials and making sure that they're the, the correct ones. All right. I feel like I'm missing a demo here that I wanted to show you guys. Did we show them how we can swap out and then have it automatically load up? I'll show them after this. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, <clears throat> lastly, so we talked a little bit about this OAuth security. Um, we could, there could be a whole session just on OAuth itself. So um, this is going to be very, very high level. But what I wanted to show you here is, so I went ahead and what's the first thing you noticed after? Right, so we have a server hosting server side hosted page that we provide um, that basically allows you to provide those credentials that you need to access your um, your uh, secured resources. So I actually am logged in already because I was playing around with some other stuff here within RGS Online. So remember the credentials that I had there. Um, you can actually, when you log in, there is a checkbox underneath it to say if you want to remember your credentials. So when you were asking about that, sir, about you know whether or not you'd have to continue to log in, no, you don't. So as long as you have that, it'll be, yeah, it's going to remember that in that particular case. Um, I'm going to say, yeah, go ahead and approve it. And you can see here I'm accessing and I've got that, that secured web service. So, or I'm sorry, not web service, uh, secured um, web app. So what we actually have here, if we take a look at the code, it's a little bit different. All right? not, there's not a whole lot more, but a little bit. So what I have is I've added two additional classes. I've got this Esri Identity OAuth Info and then my Identity Manager. So the OAuth Info is really where the, the importance is in all of this. So you create an, a new instance of this OAuth Info class, and you're going to pass in what we have is called this app ID. The app ID is going to, you pass in what's its unique identifier for a registered application that you have registered with your platform. The app ID can be seen similar to if you have worked with OAuth and you're familiar with the spec, um, the client ID. So basically the same, same concept. So you're going to pass in this app ID of this registered application, and I'm going to show you in just a moment how you can go ahead and do that. Um, you can also go in and specify whether or not you actually want the application to show, or that sign-in page to show as a pop-up, or if you want it to be in line like it is in um, that, that example. It just came directly within that page. I don't want it to show as a pop-up, mainly because I just didn't want to have to host an additional callback page. Um, if you do use that, we have, we actually host a callback.html page that you can access to work with the, the pop-ups as well. And I'll show you a little bit later if anybody's interested in how to actually access that. 
And then lastly, we've got the Esri ID, which is that identity manager, and we call this register OAuth info, and it actually it can take an array of OAuth info classes. We're just working with one in this case. So when the application runs, it sees, hey, it registers the OAuth info, it sees the OAuth info, it sees, this, it sees the application ID that we've got registered there, and it knows that we're working with OAuth info. So it prompts us, brings us up that uh, login that you just saw. So how do we actually go in and get the, uh, the registered application? So <clears throat> you can do this a couple ways. I'm familiar with doing it in RTS Online, but you can actually do it on the developer site as well. Um, in RTS Online, basically all you would do is underneath your content, you would click on Add Item and Application. And in this particular case, we're working with a web application. So I'm just going to go in, I'm going to pass in the long URL for that. But it would just be the URL for whatever application it is that you're working with. Give it a title, give it some tags. All right, so we're creating this, um, this new application that we have hosted within our, um, in my content. So if we take a look now in the settings, scroll on down, you'll see this app registration portion, okay? So we're gonna go in here, click on register, and I'm gonna be working with, I know I'm working with a browser, so I need to give it a redirect URI. All right, so basically that redirect URI, that is telling, you're passing in a URL of where you're telling your application it can be redirected to. All right, so I already created one beforehand for that sample, but basically all I did was I just, my, this machine name that's actually accessing that application is just Heather, heatherg.esri.com. Okay. But you would want to have it, make sure that you have it set so that, you know, it, whoever, the, you would have it narrowed down to whoever it is that you know can, or should be or can access this application. This is where you would pass that in. Okay, so we registered that. And this is where, um, take note of this app ID. Okay, so the app ID, again, is like I said, it's just this unique identifier. It it tells the platform which application it is that you're working with. And this is how, remember how I mentioned beforehand how you can actually go in and track the usage of how your application is being used? This is how all of that's done under the hood, okay? So it gets that app ID. You have that within your application, like that OAuth info. We're, re we're, we're passing that app ID. It knows this is, this is the app that we're working with. <clears throat> The app secret is exactly that. It's a secret. It's just like your password. So you would treat it just like your password. Um, normally, you don't need, if you're working with, we call it the named user approach. And I'm kind of saying these terms. Um, there's a lot of other, I'm going to show you in just a moment, there's a lot of really good information that's on our developer site that kind of talks a little bit more about this in detail. But the named user, if you have to get secured resources and your people need to actually log in to get it, that named user approach is what you're going to want to use. And you don't have to worry about the app secret for that. Now, if you're going to be working with um, anonymous users, you don't know. You need to host out your application. You don't know who's going to be accessing it. Let's say, like I was saying, with you, you have directions um, enabled, directions functionality enabled within your application. You don't know who's going to be accessing this. But you're willing to foot the bill for those all of those credits that are going to be used for it. That's where you would go in, and I'm going to show you in a moment, how um, using like a proxy, you can pass in the client ID and then this app secret and then um, forward all of those requests through the proxy, it sees that and then you don't have to get worried about all of the, uh, the logins. All right, so I think, am I missing anything on that? All right, I could talk for a really long time on this stuff. And I'm sure that's exactly what you guys want at 610 on Wednesday night. So I'm not going to do that. Did you mention it uses their credits? Which one? The credits? If they use the anonymous approach that it uses their... Yeah, yeah, just okay. yeah, yeah. So, okay. Okay. 
So I did talk a little bit about these credit-based services. Um, we have those, like I said, they're, you know, most, I always go to directions just because it's the one I always do my testing on. It's just a, a, a very common one. Um, that's geocoding, I believe, is still credit-based. Um, working with the geo-enrichment stuff, analysis, things like that, all of that is going to require some money. So you're going to need to go ahead and sign in for that. Um, again, there are different ways of, um, of accessing it. I mean, you can log in to get to, um, if you're working with, let's say I said, like the directions or routing, you can just go in and log in and use your credentials to access that. Um, but you probably don't want to do all that all the time. Um, like, for example, our samples that we host on RSD, our the developer site for the JavaScript samples, we have a proxy that we use just for um, demonstration purposes that um, we went ahead and put the, uh, the username, um, the client ID, and the password in there, the secret, so that um, people that want to access and play with that functionality don't have to worry about logging in and doing, worrying, logging in and having to deal with any of that. So there's a couple different ways of dealing with or getting this proxy. Um, we actually provide a way, a proxy file that you can use um, if you want to, to access these credit-based services. Uh, that you would do through the developer site. And there is a lot of really good information. Um, <clears throat> if you go to the documentation, so developers.rts.com, documentation, and if we take a look at security and authentication and working with proxy services, they have a lot of really good stuff in here. Um, the RTS Online hosted proxy service, this is where you can actually go in there and host your own, like you don't have to worry about you know, creating the, an actual file, hosting it on your own web server, configuring everything correctly, keeping it locked down. Um, we do all of that for you. Um, and that's all written, talked about here within the, uh, the developer help. Um, if you are, you, you're a little bit more controlling and you want to have that file, um, you can get to that using your own self-hosted resource proxy, which we have out on our GitHub repo. Um, or I'm sorry, yeah, so it's the resource proxy. If you guys want to take note of where that is. Um, we have it written in the .NET. We have it written in ADF.NET. Um, ASP.NET, I should say, um, JSP and PHP, all right? So this is something that um, it's kind of taken a life of its own, but mainly it came about a few years ago after, and I, I'm kind of dating myself, but I know there back in the day when we had, there was Silverlight, Flex, and JavaScript, there was no joke about, I swear, there was like 500 different proxies floating around on the web and everybody had their own and trying to, you know, get them configured to work properly. And we just wanted to have something, you know, pretty straightforward, a way that, that users were, would be able to go in. Um, and the main thing was having application authentication. So um, you can go in here, read through it. There's a lot of really good information in the README. Um, and yeah, that's about it. Let's see. I wanted to show you the directions one, though. So really quickly, before we go into anything else, yeah, accessing a credit card service. So I do want to show you a couple demos, though, that, that actually do that. Um, this one is accessing a route task that I created with credentials that were saved in a hosted service. So basically what I did is in RTS Online, I added an item, um, and I pointed to our route task that we had, that we host, I saved that out with the credentials. And when you do that, it gave, it, 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 it hosted out like as a utility, um, like a utility service. Um, as you'll notice here, this is kind of an ugly map, but I'm gonna do a, I'm just gonna do a quick route. And normally what would happen is it should prompt me um, for my credentials. It doesn't. And the reason, And the reason for that is because I'm working with this utility service that I created. So I made this um, in RGS Online and saved my credentials out, and that's that was the uh, the endpoint that I got from it. You, what I was talking about earlier with um, 
having the services created, the proxy services created for you through the developer's help, that link that I just showed you, it would be the same thing there as well. You would get a URL generated for you and you would pass that in for whatever um, task it is that you're working with that actually would generate or would require the uh, credentials. All right. Let's see, and last one. Okay, this one uses a, um, yeah, so this one is doing the same exact thing, but instead of having those credentials saved directly within that task on ArcGIS Online, what I did was I saved it within um, my proxy file. And if we take a look, that's not it. Yeah, if you take a look here, um, I have my route task, and don't worry, I'm gonna be, I'll be deleting these out in a little bit. <laughs> But this is the client secret. So if I took a look, if I open up, um, if I go back in here, did I close that down? I think I did. Did I? Yeah, I did. If you go back into where I registered that item, and you remember I should, said here's the secret, and there was a link. If I click on that, that link, that is what you would. Um, that's where you would go in, and you would add that here. Okay. So this would be analogous to having your username and your password. All right. So. What happens is, if you took a look at the code, all I'm doing is, is I'm adding a proxy rule. So we have some utilities, um, we have some utility um, classes in here that um, allow us to, to make this a little bit easier. So we add this proxy rule, we pass in, so it's saying every time you get to this route.rgs.com, I want you to route that route.rgs.com through a proxy that you have specified. This proxy is something that I have installed on my machine. Um, and then basically all it's gonna do then is gonna say, all right, I see that these credentials are saved in that proxy file, it unlocks that based upon those credentials, and then you go ahead and you can get that, that functionality that you need. Um, one thing to keep in mind when working with these proxy files hosted on, by your, on your own is that, again, it's, it has all of your information in it, right? So you're definitely going to want to make certain that you have those locked down um, and pretty secure on your own end. So let me see. All right. I showed you the authentication documentation. Um, we have some additional information on the API or within the JavaScript API. If you go to developers.rgs.com forward slash JavaScript or just js.rgs.com, go to um, the guide topic, and then underneath reference, we have a link here for the proxy pages. And I just recently ported a bunch of this stuff over, so there might be hopefully not anything really missing, So, um, but it should be pretty, it, it'll give you some more information on how to work with them and some samples and snippets on how you can bring those in and work with them within the API. You see anything weird that doesn't quite look right, click on this feedback on this topic. It comes to all of us on the team. So we'll go ahead and fix it. So I think that might be it. Can you switch back to mine really quickly? Yes, 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 yes. So we showed you a lot of great um, samples and demos in Heather's repository. There's also samples in the JavaScript API help. So if you just come to the JS, um, the ArcGIS.com link that Heather mentioned, if you go to samples and you just search for portal, you'll see that there's eight or so results that show you how to create a layer from a portal item, load portal items through drag and drop. There's some OAuth samples, some web scene samples. So it's worth um, checking out and seeing what's available in the JavaScript API help as well for ideas on applications or, or code if you're trying to build an app with this functionality. So I just wanted to make sure to point them out. This is an interesting one that lets you swap web maps in the same view if you're building some sort of um, gallery type app. We have three web map IDs that are stored in the source code and when you click on one of these tabs it loads that new web map inside of that view. So we have three separate, three separate web maps available. And all the source code is there. And you can see that we have this array that stores the web map IDs. When we load the map, we show the first web map in that array. Sorry, here's the array of IDs. We show that first web map in the array. 
And then when one switches out, we're switching out the attribute IDs for the new one. So that source code is available um, in the dev help. I think it's kind of an interesting sample. I think we're supposed to remind you about the survey. Yes. So if you can have any feedback, uh, constructive criticism, that kind of thing, the survey is a great place to put it. It'll help us make this session better next year and make sure that we're answering questions that you thought would get answered by coming to this session. Is that it? Don't be shy. Any questions? So your question was, is like, there a difference between, so the, res the resource proxy and a proxy that you would host on your, that the resource proxy is what you would host on your own, like that, that would be the file that you would download and have on your, your web server that you had everything that you're going to be proxying through. There's no separate, like that, that would be the, the self-contained file, the self-contained proxy. Yeah. So, um, and then I have familiarity with the one, I have familiarity with the proxy, like ASA guys, or... Mm -hmm. yeah, yep. So yeah, that's, that's in the resource proxy. So if you open, if we took a look at, um, if you take a look at the, the resource proxy on GitHub, you'll see here we've got .NET, we've got the Java and PHP. So if you're familiar with the ASX, ASHX one, is that the one? Yeah. You can go in there and you probably, what you probably have is you've downloaded that and you've configured in the config file, you've configured, and I don't think I mentioned that's where you put it in. You have a config file that you would put all of your, um, your, um, your information in. Um, so I'm assuming, do, is that how you have it set up on your end? No, no, I, so I, I, the only use case I understood for this was to kind of get around some of the cores issues. Yeah, so you can but, use it for cores issues. That's, that is one option. Um, but, also, yeah. Are you saying it doubles also as essentially the utilities at rks.com for the security? Yes, system? exactly. Yeah, so it can double out and use it for that. So his question was he thought initially it was just for cores. Like a lot of times when we actually have... Um, I just wrote this because we had a lot of questions. People were having some issues understanding cores and cores enabled servers. Right above this proxy page is one. We had this cores guide topic um, and it tells you when you would need proxy pages, when you don't need proxy pages, what it is. It's going to give you like a lot of the, um, these, um, like some of the warnings and error messages that you might get. You probably you know, cannot load, no access can control, allow origin header, things like that. So. Yeah, I mean, um, but in addition to the, the cores issues, um, proxies can also be used as well for the, like we're showing in the secured concept. Yes, yep, yep. Any other questions? Or if you're shy, you can come on up. This is our last session for the day, so we can answer offline. So your question was, if does the, the, the .NET one have, I'm sorry, have what in there? No, no, it's used for that as well. Yeah, it's not, it's, it's not just strictly for cores. Uh, I do not know how they have it written for RTS Online. I'm assuming it's probably not exactly the same. Um, it might be very similar, but I'm sure they've, they've probably done some tweaks to it, yeah. Any other questions? A few more minutes? No? You guys are ready? It's done? It's the end of the day? You're hungry? You want to go? I, I understand. <laughs> So if they're working with an open API they're, and they're accessing a secured resource off of that? 
I would. I personally haven't seen it. I'm sure there. I'm. Anytime you start to get third-party open source stuff in there, I mean, it can lead some room for some some things that can pop up. Um, we probably would need to take a look at stuff like that and see maybe if there's something that. Yeah. If you have. Um, you can take that offline, but I'm thinking probably might be, that would be like more of a specific use case where I would have to take a look and actually see where the problem might be coming from. So, yeah. All right. All right. Well, thank you, everybody. You have a wonderful night. Appreciate you staying so late. Enjoy the rest of your days in Palm Springs.